when you're in the film industry and you make movies like we do, it is important to collaborate. Yeah. You've got to share your ideas, man. Okay? So let's have a look. Let's pray that the idea... So you are... Uh, ooh, should we be speaking about this? Well, it's part of the movie, really, yeah. yeah. It's part of the making. Of course we can. 72, 72 hours movie. We've got a problem. Yeah. We've got a problem. No, this is called 127 hours. It's not 72 hours. Oh, uh, what is it? It's an Australian... Oh, no, that's not... That's that movie? Yep. Uh, it's James... Fr yeah, I'll turn it... Whoa. No, oh, it's just a... It's too much. Just, isn't it, really? Yeah. That's just not a shot. Working hard's all about. Same with, do you know Victoria? Mm. You know, look at her, mate. She's mm. killing it. So, how, how did you get into film and all that, acting? Yeah, you know... Interesting, interesting question. Mm. Um, I'm going to be fair to income about this one, because this is for real. When I was a five, six, seven, eight year old boy, uh, one of the friend, family friend, an actor, a gentleman by the name of um, Kevin Healy, an English chap, very close friend of the family's, he always suggested, when I was a little boy, he was very close with my family, spent a lot of time with us, and he always suggested when I was a little boy that I should be an actor. And in fact, he got me slightly involved auditioning for parts, etc. back in the 70s, in the early 70s. However, my family, my father particularly, didn't believe that acting or art or music was really any way that a person can make a living, which is almost ridiculous. Uh, so they stopped me from singing and doing plays and pantomimes etc which i really loved and then it was only back in mm, about five or six years ago that somebody was making a short film and they called me up and they said max we think that you might be the right guy for this role and that movie is actually called maltese well there's there's three but the first one was called um oh my god so it's funny when you've made 50 movies, 60 movies, you forget names of them. So there was Maltese Connection, there was Perfect Mash, and the other film, the first of the trilogy that I can't even remember the name of, Batman, that's what happens, you know? And so I did these three feature length movies. After that, I took on a lot of much smaller, shorter roles. And well, there you have it. Now I've been acting for about five or six years and I've probably been involved with about, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 short films. I've made three feature films where I've starred. I've been an extra in a couple of films that have been, you know, on, in the cinemas, etc., on the big screen. Um, and now I'm collaborating with this really cool writer, great editor and fantastic with the camera, a guy called Darcy. And um, we're collaborating on a project. You wait and see, man. 72 hours. It's something that's going to be out of this world. Rock and roll. Max Volmeister. Here with Darcy. Power to the people. Over. You got any favourite movies? Yeah, favourite movies. You know, there's movies that are significant in my life. They're not necessarily favourite movies, but movies that affected me. One was called Chinatown, and I think it was Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway. I can't remember the year, but Jack Nicholson has his nose cut with a switchblade. That scene, I'll never, ever forget. I was probably, you know, six or seven years old, and it's not something that a kid that age should see. So that movie's stuck in my head for my entire life. Um, Favourite movie is Blues Brothers, and I saw that uh, when it was in Sydney when it first came out about 1979 it may have been the Barclay it was down at Haymarket it was a B-grade movie which has now become one of the best cult movies in all time and uh, rest in peace John Belushi you gotta love the man uh, and I'm gonna give you one more movie yeah trains planes and automobiles you know John Candy that guy is fucking brilliant it's a very very clever man a very very funny man his expressions what can I say? Mm. What a guy. And that's a little bit about the movies I like. I like music, I like rock and roll, I like 
ACDC, I like the Rolling Stones, I like the Sex Pistols, I like the Foo Fighters, I like Canned Heat Man. Um, yeah, that's what I like, and I like to party. Yeah, I like to party, right? Don't forget that. I like to party 420 mm -hmm. all the time, and I'm a bit of a boozer, so let's rock and roll. Mm -hmm. That's me. That's all my stuff. What kind of music do you like? Well, like I said, Rolling Stones, ACDC. I like singing ACDC. Yeah. My favourite fucking guitarist is Angus Young. <laughs> There ain't nobody better on stage with the guitar than Angus Young. Um, and the singer, Bon Scott, well, man, I do a good Bon Scott. I like singing ACDC on mm. stage. And Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl, yeah, man, he's cool. And let's not forget good old Mick and Keith. Uh, you know, over the years, frequently people have yelled out. In fact, one time I was... I was playing harmonica in um, in a club in Hong Kong. The club's the um, Ned Kelly Ned Kelly's bar. Oh. It's a blues and jazz bar in Hong Kong. And I was playing harmonica there. And marvelous, and I've still got it on film. I'm sitting there. I'd had a drinking competition with the rest of the bar. <laughs> Pussyfoots. I won the competition. So on slamming my glass down upside down, I started to play harmonica. Oh. A fucking dude walks in the door and he yells out, "Look!" There's Mick Jagger playing harmonica. So that was one of my favourite moments. I must say, I was pretty impressed when somebody yelled out and called me Mick Jagger, but it has happened a few times. I don't know why I get Keith Richards fucking frequently. Um, let's just say, oh, 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 hang on. Steve Tyler, yeah, yeah, he's a pretty cool dude too. I wouldn't mind if people called me Steve Tyler, but my smile ain't fucking wide enough. So, that's the music I like. My favourite place is Waikiki Beach in Honolulu. Um, I like King's Bar there. I like all the bars there in Honolulu. Mm. I like this bar. I don't even know how to say it. At Venice Beach in California. Man, I like that bar. The name of it's on the back here. I'm going to give you a fucking plug. Right on, man. I like that bar. I met some nice girls in that bar. And I suppose... What am I good at? You ask me, what am I good at? I'm glad you asked, what a great question. Not much, this won't take long to answer. But I am good at inventing party games. So, if you're having a party, doesn't matter what resources you do or don't have, or who's gonna be there, I don't give a fuck. I can come, entertain, and invent a game for you and your guests. Mm. I can do that, that's what I like to do. That's what I'm good at, is inventing good party fun. I'm the party animal, you provide the party, we have fun. Simple as that. That's another Volmeister enterprise. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, what else do you want to know? Yeah, my shoe size is... Fuck my shoe size, who gives a damn? But I'll tell you why you should give a damn, because, oh yeah, my fetish, I have a fetish for socks. Yeah, it's true. If you've heard people talking about Max Volmeister and Sidecar Farrell, they'll say that's that queer sock guy. Yeah, 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 I don't like queer, but sock guy is correct. Today I'm wearing pineapples after my band, Sweaty Pineapple. Yeah, that's right. Steve the Wrecker and Max Vormeister, Sweaty Pineapple. Look at these beautiful socks. Look at these beautiful, but I got lots of socks. I love my socks. I love my socks so much. I don't know how much, but how, how do you measure how much you love something? when you're not talking about a woman. Mm. When you're talking about a woman and you talk about love, you feel it in the heart. You beat, beat, beat. My heart is beating, man. But when you're talking about socks, is there a scale of how much a person can like their socks? A scale that other people will recognize as mm. an instrument in measurement. If he doesn't like socks, he's a socophobe. If he does like socks, he's a sock, sockaholic. I'm a sockaholic. So there you've heard a bit about me. That's it. Right. Sockaholic. From Sydney, Australia. Max Volmeister, Sidecar Farrell, and The Prick. Cut. Uh, just talk, man. You know, the internet is the greatest invention. I mean, oh fuck, I've seen a man land on the moon. I've seen 
all sorts of stuff happened in my life, right? Like I was born 9th of June, 1965. My poor mother had a very laborious time because of the three of us, but that's another story. Anyway, but what I was saying, Darcy, is since I was born, I've discovered lots of things, right? And lots of things have happened around me. Men have landed on the moon and done all sorts of shit. But the internet, the internet. I remember somebody said to me, they said, hey, dude, I'm going away. You can catch me on Yahoo. I said, Yahoo? How will you hear me? In the olden days, when you said Yahoo, you did it with your, you cut your two hands together. You go, Yahoo! That's how you do a Yahoo. There was no dot com. Fucking now there is. And there's no screaming. Well, you can scream all about it. Yahoo. And there's another one. Amazon, right? Amazon. When I think of Amazon, I think of girls over six foot tall with big boobs, right? That's what I think of when I think of Amazon, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, a fucking company comes along. And this company is not just like a company. It's not like fucking Bowmaster Enterprises. This company is like a whole world. This company is big as the world itself. Soon there won't be enough room on this planet. Some of these companies are getting so fucking big. This is my prediction. I can see Elon Musk hooking up with uh, uh, Gates and a couple of those others. They're going to build a planet. They're not going to build. They're going to colonise a planet just, just for their company. That's how big their companies are going to get. When you're going to order a book from Amazon, you know where it's going to come from? It's not going to come from, there's no room anymore for these big books. Look, they've got to physically provide you with something, right? Not everything can be data in the middle of this fucking digital age. When you order a book or clothes or shoes or socks, it's got to arrive. And if it's got to arrive, it means it's got to have come from somewhere, right? So if they're getting that big, where the fuck are they going to house their, co their company? I mean, the logistics of it all, they're going to have to have a big warehouse and distribution centre somewhere, I reckon, probably on the moon. That's the closest. I reckon a global distribution centre. And, you know, it might sound expensive at the moment, but remember the Earth spinning, right? So you fucking cast it out of the orbit at the right time, it might just land in the right place. Hey, I need uh, a couple of dozen bottles of a beer in Chatswood. Sweet! Have a look at your time, have a look at the gravity, have a look at which way the world's spinning at the time. Do a few calculations. Check out those chicks, those three chicks in that movie. They were really good recently in uh, NASA. They worked out the trajectory on a piece of paper. They'll be employed, they've got a job, they can send us, they can project all their fucking parcels all the way from the moon right down here to Chatswood. Or Manly, Manly Dam, wherever you might be. Do you reckon that could happen? It probably could. It probably fucking could. Right. So, in 10 years' time, you go for a job interview, right? You apply for a job and you say, I want to work with Amazon. Where do you think you're going to fucking interview? You know how sometimes they say, oh, look, uh, will you be available for an interview on um, Thursday? And you say, yeah, 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 that'll be fine. I'm quite keen for the job, I can make that. And uh, you think about what you're going to wear, you know, on that day, and you prepare yourself and think, jeez, it's the day before, it's Wednesday now, and you've got an interview the next day. <laughs> and now, as we have it, you sort of think, right, well, that's sweet. I'll get up in the morning, I'll have a good shave, groom myself, make myself look presentable, pick up the stuff I need, get dressed, hop on the train, whatever, and go for an interview. Not anymore, mate. You will have to plan this a week in advance. You'll have to go to fucking training at astronaut school just so you can go to the interview. The interview process will be the most expensive part of the employment of any employee from now on, when we're going to have to ship people to and from the moon and other planets. Anyway, that's what I reckon is going to happen. That's why I don't want to work for anybody else anymore. I'll work with Darcy, no one else. And Penny too, of course. She's my wife. Miss P, Super P.
So what else, man? Well, I've been thinking about inventing a car. A car that runs on gravity. Mm. And it goes downhill, but it fucking works. Mm. Um, that was one of my inventions. Um, what? Oh. You know what I'm doing? No. I'm using an old technique. It's an old Indian technique. To bring back memories. Mm. You see how they have a dream catcher? Mm. They also have a memory gatherer. It's a dance like this. And then you do that and it helps you to bring back memories. And I remember now my first feature film was called Colombian Casserole. That's right. Yeah, and admittedly, it was written and directed, or written, by uh, J.D. Harriman, and directed by uh, Steve Petherbridge. Yeah, it was a good movie, and they're nice guys. They did a good job. Anyway, what was I telling you about the... Oh, it's all coming back to me now. Memory gatherer. <whistles> Here a lady jumped off. Oh, hey, I, I don't know what happened. You see, they found a dead body in Chatswood yesterday. <whistles> Nasty. Yeah, they found a dead body in a local school here as well. Yesterday? Yeah, yesterday Two as well. Two dead bodies. Were they connected? No. Wait, what way, happened about the chat? Yeah. Chatswood over yeah. here to connect the two bodies. Uh, what dead. happened to the Chatswood people? Well, apparently, at 6 something a.m. in the morning, a man, and I'm going to tell you this now because, yeah, in fact, this is fucking got me puzzled. But a white man found the body, right? And the fucking phone is up there, and I've got his name. But this guy's got a four barreled name. How many people do you meet with a four barreled bloody name? Mm. So it said, Mr. Such and Such Rapunzel, Rapunzel, Shababa, Bababa, found this dead body. I mean, fuck the dead body. I'm still getting over the four-barrel name. Mm. Anyway, get back to the memory gatherer on that one because I'm going to have to dig that up. That's important, right? That's probably one of the most... So, yeah, yeah they, this bloke with the four-barrel name found the body fairly early in the morning and he says, he quite calmly says, well, when I felt her hand, I knew she was dead. I mean, where'd this guy get this experience? That's what I want to know. I mean, fuck, how many dead hands has he felt? He says, you're walking along the road, you see a body covered in blood, it's fallen 26 fucking floors, you'd assume it would be dead. Do you need mm. to feel the fucking hand? Mm. I don't know. That's a, but he says, on feeling the hand, I, I, I knew she was deceased. Mm. I might have been able to guess that. So I don't know whether this guy's really got sensitive palms or he's just a bullshitter. But I'm going to get back to you about his name. That's the part of the story that I like most. So they found that he finds a body. He calls the police. He says there were four squad cars there within five minutes. Mm. How does he know it wasn't five squad cars in four minutes? You know what I mean? If he gets confused, it's a very easy story to get confused. Anyway, the police were there with negotiators because... Not only was there the deceased on the ground, there was an agitated man on the 26th floor on an awning above the gymnasium. Mm. Now, after an hour, they gave the man a drink of water and a cigarette. I mean, I'm thinking I'm up there, not me personally, but I'm doing suicide. No, let's put it the other way. I am the suicide prevention officer of the police. And I'm hanging out of a window and there's a guy on a ledge and he says to me, and I'm thinking, are you going to jump? And he says, could you give me a glass of water and a cigarette? <laughs> he's running the fucking show here. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, so he's up there, this bloke negotiating over cigarettes and water with this bloke, come on in, you know. And for the whole damn time, because... You know, when a body falls 26 floors, it can cause a lot of damage. Mm. I can understand their concern. You see, they weren't able to remove the deceased.
because their concern was if another body comes flying down, we can't have mm. more injury, right? And so, yeah. g'day. Good. So, what I'm thinking about is, I'm thinking, I remember once, right, I fell about 15 metres, and I can't recall how fast I gained speed, but I can remember when I hit the fucking ground and I went BANG! And it made so much noise that everybody in the whole apartment block was disturbed. Yeah, they were all yelling out, what's that noise? What's that noise? And I'm screaming, hey! I was bleeding and blood and vomit and everything coming out of every fucking hole in my body. And I'm lying on the ground going, ah, me, it's me. And that was only from 15 metres, about four floors. So <laughs> I can understand this guy up there on the 26th floor, if he'd come, if they'd been trying to remove the deceased, I like how I use that word deceased, if they'd been trying to remove the deceased and Mr. Cigarette and Water demands upstairs, 26th floor, he comes over, we could have another, not only two fatalities, but we could have damage to, you know, a squad car, you could have paramedics <laughs> splat everywhere, right? So that's what happened yesterday and that's what's the story. I know I might sound a little bit unkind and uncaring, but I am caring, man. I'm thinking about those people. I'm thinking about that negotiator, mm. right? Yeah, I'll drink to that. A lot of birds around here. Mm -hmm. Do you know the sound of the, um, the African pygmy swallow? You don't, it's like this. That's the African pygmy swallow. Uh, I know a few other bird noises. Hmm. What about the... Get ready for this one. Get ready for this one. The Colombian River Parrot. Now the fucking Colombian River Parrot has a, a beak on it like... Like this. Like, like fucking big, right? And when it, when it talks, it doesn't make a whistle like that, it makes a grabber, 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 grabber. Hmm. That's a Colombian river parrot, right? Some people call it the uh, CRP. But I like to call it, it's full name, Colombian river parrot. And have you seen the, um, the British wren? It has an extraordinary sound. It, it, it fills its whole chest with, with wind and, and foo like these. They're not gills because gills are on fish, but through mm. these, this, this British wren makes a sound like a krill, like a <laughs> That's the sound of the British wren. So, I've pretty well topped off what I wanted to talk about today was the danger of trying to extract people off ledges when they're attempting suicide or threatening suicide if you're paramedic on the ground. I've talked about interesting, exciting birds from around the world. I've talked about the <whistles> the old American Indian memory gathering technique. And as you've seen, it worked, right? So it's obviously not BS. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Today marks the day of a new beginning. That's it. That's it. That's it. Beginning of what? Today. No idea. No idea? That's not the answer I want to hear. I need an excuse for my behaviour. Oh, it's recording, let me know. So, not everything I'm going to tell you is necessarily going to be true. And it's up to you, the audience, to decide or, or, or gauge, measure. I don't know. It's up to you to whether you believe it or not. I don't care. I do. No, I don't fucking care. Do I care? Do I look like I care? 
man wearing this hat, does he care about what people think about his fucking stories? But here's the story, right? One day, I'm on the elevator. That's the one with the stairs. And I'm going down the elevator, right? And there's a guy in front of me. His name's Joe. And he has the Oporto uh, fast food outlet in Hornsby, Westfield. And Joe's on the elevator escalator, the one with the stairs. He's on it and he's a bit in front of me, right? And as we get to the bottom, I see grandma and her little daughter in her little ballerina tutu hopping on the escalator to go up the other way. And I'm thinking, I'm sure that tutu is going to get caught in the escalator. It looks like something could happen. So I'm pretty excited already, right? And yeah, sure enough, the little baby girl's uh, tutu gets caught in the escalator, right? This is going to fucking great. Well, next thing you know, Grandma, she doesn't think very well. Instead of stopping the elevator or turning around, she bends down backwards, facing down the escalator to pull her little granddaughter out to get her free. Well, I knew I could see what was going to fucking happen here. I can see Grandma doing a cartwheel down the escalator upside down. And sure enough, that's what happens next, right? Straight away. Well, Joe goes running to assist them, right? He goes running in front of me. He's going to be the bloody hero. I thought to myself, there's two things that could happen here. And one of them is I could get hurt. So I decided I wasn't going to really help. But so as this lady's going up the escalator, upside down with her legs in the air and a skirt over her head and her little bloody granddaughter somewhere underneath her, everybody's joined in and they're trying to get this lady around the upside. How stupid. I said, you're all idiots. I said, why are you doing that? I said, look, all you need to do is just hold her, keep her calm, hold her head, and let her ride out the escalator. And then when she gets to the top, you just slide her off, mate. You spin her around on her feet and perch her back up again. Fucking logistics, it's easy. I used to work in a warehouse, by the way. Um, now, another story, and once again, it's up to you, the viewer, to decide on whether this is true or not. But the details make it sound true, and it probably is. So there I was at East Gardens where they have a travel later. Now, a travel later's not like stairs or an escalator. It's like a fucking moving thing that goes downhill or uphill. Anyway, I'm down the bottom of the travel later, and I hear someone scream out at the top of their voice. You know what they screamed out? You, sir, help that lady. So I look up, and they're looking at me, and there's a lady rolling down the fucking escalator in her wheelchair full speed. Again, two things that could happen. And one of them is I could get hurt. So what did I do? I jumped from my side into the other escalator, right? And all these people were screaming, stop, mate, stop. And I'm thinking, why are they fucking angry with me? Just because I didn't rescue her doesn't make me a bad person. I didn't push her down the escalator, right? Did I? <laughs> no, I didn't. But at that same spot, and this is... Another true story. Whoops. I wasn't meant to tell you they're all true stories. Anyway, another true story. In that same place one day, I was right up the top in this three levels of uh, this, like, big shopping mall. And I had my McDonald's. Hello, free ice creams. I had my McDonald's 30 cent ice cream. And I looked at it and I thought, there's only one better place this could go than in my mouth. All right? And then I looked down about, oh. 40 foot and there's these people walking down around on the bottom in this mall and I thought the one place this ice cream could go better than my mouth would be on top of somebody down there in the mall especially if it hits their head so there I did it uh, uh, it's so hard <laughs> not anyway I let go and I looked down Whoa, I missed fuck but I tell you what, it scared the shit out of a few people. There's fucking ice cream all over. You throw an ice cream, you drop it. Once again, gravity, I can't work out something per second. You know, I never counted how many seconds it took me to fall that fucking 15 metres. But if you speak to somebody that knows about gravity, the bloke with the apples, was that the man that got hit on the head by an apple? He knew about gravity. Well, he can probably tell you such and such per second. Well, that's how fast that ice cream was going when it hit the fucking ground and... There should be a measure. I'm, I'm not just interested in the speed things fall. I want to know how far things... I want to know so I can drop things and have them 
everywhere. I want to know exactly what I need to do to find out, to discover how far things will when I drop them from high heights. There needs to be a formula for that. Fuck gravity times something plus equals x squared and reactivity and relativity and all that shit. Two times something pi equals 7 over 21, 3.144. I don't care. I want to know how things are going to when I drop them off high heights. That's more important to me, right? Then I don't need to worry so much about accuracy, right? Anyway, that's that's all I want to say. And if you can believe a man wearing a jester hat, well, there you go. And I need a drink. Sidecar Farrell, Volmeister, the prick. We're out of here. That's not him, that's him. <laughs>